scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 28. Then the end will come when he, meaning Jesus, hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. This is God's word. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we offer this sermon to you, Lord. Let it be that people will hear your voice speaking to their hearts, that my words will be foolish, but yours will be wise, that it will be you, Father, drawing people, leading to people, touching their hearts, Father. Let my words be nothing, but let your words be everything, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Two thousand years ago, we know that Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians, and that's the book that we've been studying recently. We know that he was dealing with the troubled church, and because of this he dealt with a lot of very common, very ordinary, very worldly problems, arguments within the church, divisions between people as to which leader to follow, morality problems marriage and divorce problems, questions about changes in society, about what to do with the food that would be be offered to idols, how to have an orderly worship service, and people having spiritual gifts and being so proud and feeling that they were better than other people because of these gifts. Common problems, just common things, the sort of things that you would expect to go in a church that you hope that are not there, but somehow they do often seem to be there, divisions, problems about morality. It always seems to be there. And yet Paul wrote this letter dealing with such common things, but he kept telling them, look beyond this. Go past this because there is so much more. He talked to them about God's wisdom when he wrote about it in 1 Corinthians 22 to 24. The Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Greeks and Jews, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Look beyond and see, look beyond the normal problems of the world and see Christ crucified. See the wisdom of God. Look beyond and see God's love. When they look at the divisions, he calls them, look beyond and see more. He starts the famous chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, and I will show you now the most excellent way. And he finishes with these words, and these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Look beyond. Look beyond and see. Look beyond and see God's wisdom. Look beyond this world and see God's love. Look beyond and see the end because the end will come. He wrote about it. It started in uh, uh, chapter 15, verse 24. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the kingdom of God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. The end. The end will come. It's easy for us to look at the past We have a fairly good understanding of that. We know the creation story. We know about the fall, about sin, about death entering this world. We know about the Old Testament times. We have a very accurate record in the Bible. 
we know about the first coming of Christ, and we know about the creation of the church, about the beginning of the church age. But there's more. These things are not the end. Somehow it seems wrong, and we think it should be. Even Jesus said it on the cross. He said, it is finished. But it's just the beginning. There was more from this. There will be a future. There will be an end. What exactly the future looks like, we don't know. It's in the Bible, there's many things. I'm going to give you an approximate order. Some people disagree about the exact order, but the things that I talk about, these are the things that will come. Whether which comes first, which comes second, approximately these things will happen. There will be the rapture described in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where we write, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. It will come, but it is not the end. After that will be the tribulation, the tribulation that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, verse 21, for then there will be a great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. A terrible time that the world must go through. But still, it is not the end. There must be more. The second coming of Christ, the first judgment. Satan must be bound, and there must be the millennium where Satan is bound for a thousand years. In Revelation, we read about it, and he said, Jesus, he threw him into the abyss and locked him and sealed it, over, sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. The world must go through these things, but still this is not the end. Satan is released, and there will be a final rebellion. Satan will be defeated, and then there will be the final resurrection and a judgment. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented, tormented day and night forever and ever. It will happen. But even that is not the end. Revelation 20:15. If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. It will happen, but this is still not the end. If these things are not the end, then what is this end that Paul writes about? What is this end that we look towards? Not the cross, not even the second coming, not the millennium, not Satan bound, not these things, but look beyond. Look beyond and see something more. Look beyond and see the God that God has for us. The end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. When he talks about this dominion, authority, and power, is that what he's describing in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Not people, not governments, because Paul writes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The end will come. Jesus will hand over the kingdom to God the Father. Jesus will have destroyed all dominion, all authority, all power. And yet there's more. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be, may be all in all. This is the end that Paul writes about. Something that goes beyond anything that we can imagine. 
that goes beyond the little problems that were occurring in the church in Corinth, that goes beyond the small problems that we have in this church, that goes beyond even the cross and the resurrection. Because the cross was not the end. It was a new beginning that was leading to a different end. The end where Jesus hands over the kingdom to God the Father. The end where the dominions, authorities, and powers, evil is destroyed. The end where the enemies are put under his feet. The end where death is destroyed. The end when Jesus will be subject to the Father who put everything under him. The end when God will be all in all. To understand what the, revel what the end will look like, we need to look at other parts of the Bible. Particularly, we need to look at Revelation and see how this describes what the end will look like. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2, gives us these words. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. The end talks about a city. We've known cities. We live in a city now. The city started right from the beginning in the Bible. The first city that, that the Bible tells us about was Enoch, written about in Genesis. We read in Genesis 4.17, Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after Enoch, his son. Cain, the son of Adam and Eve, who had murdered his brother Abel. Cities were often places of sin, vice, destruction, places of power, places of authority. The first murderer was to build the first city. Babel was talked about. And we read in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, Then he said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the earth, over the face of the whole earth. Let us build a city for ourselves, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Cities are places of pride, of jealousy, of envy, of wanting to be better, better even than God. And in Revelation, it talks about Babylon, not the Babylon that existed so long ago, but a different Babylon, representing the culture that exists in our world. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury saw the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour your doom has come. The great city. We live in a world of great cities. Shanghai, New York, Los Angeles, London, Paris, Sydney. Maybe not so great sometimes. <laughs> In Australia, it's good. <laughs> the great city is not just a collection of buildings. It's not just a collection of bricks piled on top of each other. It's a culture that it represents. What goes on there? The pride, the wealth, the influence, the power, the envy, the competition, the destruction. Corinth understood this. Corinth knew all about cities. It was located in this important place, this narrow section of land between two seas, between the waters, and they used thousands and thousands of slaves to drag the ships out of the water across the land and put them back into the water again. Death was common among these slaves, soldiers to keep them in line with whippings and crucifixions and sin. Corinth was a place of power. It was a place of wealth. It was a place of influence. It was a place of sin. A great city. One of the great cities of that time. 
But when we look beyond, we see something else. When Jesus calls us to look at the end, we look beyond the great city that we live in and we see the holy city. The holy city is what we're called to. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The holy city. That's the end. That's what we look towards. What will it be like, this place? Will it be like Taipei? Will there be an MRT system? Will there be garbage collectors playing for release? What will it be like? Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God will be with us. That was what the city will be like. That we will live together with God. The city shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that, a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, which is about 1,300, 1, sorry, 1,300, 800 miles, but 2,500 kilometers. It's a huge city, as wide and as high as it is long. Perhaps it looks like this, the holy city. We say to look beyond, but it is beyond. It is beyond any other understanding. But this is the end that we will have the end that we are called towards. Not the great city that we live in, not the great city that we see around these worlds, but the holy city. I can't imagine what it's going to be like. But we know some things that will not be there. Tears, death, mourning, crying, pain, they will not be in this holy city. They'll be gone because we read in Revelation 21.4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more pain or mourning or crying or pain for the old order has passed away. These things will not be there. Ungodly behavior, this will not be there. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Those people, we pray for them. We hope that they will change. We hope that God will lead them and guide them to him. But they will not be there in the end. And the temple, the temple that was so important to the Jews, the temple will not be there. The temple where the Jews performed all their sacrifices, the temple that the Jews rebuilt again and again, that will be gone. Revelation 21, 22, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The sun and the moon will not be there. The city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The curse that we live under, the curse that came from Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis 3.17, to Adam he said, God said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree from which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. The curse that we exist in in this world, the curse upon this earth, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. This is the end. 
what we are called to look towards, what we are called to see. We see so many common problems in this world. We see common problems in this church. And Paul writes his letter and says, yes, deal with these problems, but look beyond. Look beyond and see God's wisdom. Look beyond and see God's love. Look beyond and see the future that God has for us. The road will be hard. Nobody's promising an easy road. The world must go through many difficulties, but there is the end, a place that we will share with God, that we will be together with Him, a place of no more pain, a place of no more tears, a place of no more death, a place that shines with the glory of God. A place that we will be in the presence of God all the time. It will be a place with many things. The things that you enjoy now, many of them will still be there, but perfect. Fruit, water, stones, walls, gates, these things will be there. Physical things. It will be there. But most important, God and His people will be there. That will be the end. That is the future that God calls us to. That is the future that Paul says, look beyond and see. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and He will live with them. They will be His people and God himself will be with them and be their God. The end, the end that we will have, except even that's not the end because we share eternity, eternity with God, eternity in the holy city. In this world that we live in now, as the Corinthians had a choice, they could see what they wanted to see. You can choose. The great city of Corinth offered many things. It offered wealth, it offered power, it offered education, you could hire the best philosophers to teach you. It offered so many things the same as we live in this world, and this world offers us so many things, this culture that we have. Education is not a bad thing. Money is not a bad thing. Work is not a bad thing. Position is not a bad thing. But when you replace God with those things, then those things are nothing. They are worthless. They are worse than worthless because they will keep you from the holy city you will have the great city which is valueless and you will miss out on the holy city which is everything. This is the future we're called to, the end. This is the choice we make and we make it at the cross. The cross is the beginning, the beginning of the pathway towards the end of that shared eternity with God when we will dwell with him. It's a choice that every one of us must make in his heart. Which city will you choose? The great city that offers you so much in this world? Or the holy city? And the pathway to the holy city is always through the cross. I know living in this world is confusing. You have friends that have chosen this world. You have family that have chosen this world. Perhaps you also are in doubts which world to choose. I'd like us to take a moment of prayer, and particularly for those of us that we love and that we care about, that have chosen the good things of this world, but they will miss the end, the end that God offers us, to look beyond and see that holy city. Let us pray for ourselves and let us pray for them, them that are lost.
Lord God, our Father in heaven, we turn to you and we look towards the end, the end that you offer that goes through the cross to the pathway that you lead us to be with you forever and ever and ever into all eternity, dwelling in the holy city with you. But Father, this world has distractions. This world has confusions. This world has addictions. This world has ties on so many people and it's so difficult for them to break away. Use us, Father, to carry your light, to carry the light of your holy city, to carry the light of the end that you offer us in this world of darkness, this world that needs you so desperately, Father. We pray, Father, for our families, those who do not yet know you, who are distracted and caught up in this world. We pray to you, Father, for our friends, those that have chosen the wrong path, the path of worldly gain, the path of being in this world and have turned away from following you. We pray to you, Father, for our friends and families that they will be in that holy city with us, Lord, because we know that you love them. You love them as you love us. You love them so much that you sent your son Jesus into this world to die for them. Father, we ask that you call them, use us to reach out to them, but call them, Father, to turn to you so that we may share this holy city together, this end that you have promised us. And as everyone continues to pray, perhaps there is someone here that has still not given his life to Christ. If it's you, but you feel something tugging in your heart, something calling, this saying, this is the time, this is the place, then understand what you are. You are the same as us, a person who sins. But God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent your son Jesus into this world to pay the price for those sins so that God will look to you and call you his son or his daughter and you can call him your father and know his love and his guidance and his direction. All you have to do is say, yes, I accept. Is there anybody here today who wishes to accept this gift that off God offers to you, that wishes to turn away from this world and turn towards the path that God is leading them on? If that is you, can you raise your hand and let me lead you in prayer? Anybody? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Is there anybody else? Pray this prayer with me. Lord God, our Father in heaven, I admit that I am a sinner. I have not done the things that I should have done. And I have done things that I should not have done. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. I confess here and now that I accept him as my Lord and my Savior. I give him my life and I will follow him from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.